Um, kia ora tato, good evening. And um, I'm sorry my voice isn't quite as loud as normal. I'm, um, I think I'm well past a cold, so I'm, I, don't, I don't think you, you, I'll pass on what you, to you what I've had. Um, but I'm still um, slightly croaky, and I have some lozenges in my pocket should I need them. Uh, I'll just check um, with Colin, though, um, how, we do, how should I schedule this time-wise? We, we, we've got... We've got to, up until 9 o'clock, so... Oh, my um, goodness, it's only half past seven. Yes. <laughs> right. Okay, well... Oh, I'll skip the long version. Don't get <laughs> <laughs> um, Plenty of time for this question. Okay, no, that's good. Don't, don't <laughs> um, no, no. Um, I will keep an eye on the time, just so I don't go too early. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me back. It's always a great pleasure to be here at um, St. Luke's. Um, my wife, then, is here once a week teaching yoga on Tuesdays, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, usually the other room mm -hmm. down there. Uh, and um, she is sorry she can't come along tonight, but she's rehearsing her next show. So she's um, off doing that. Um, when I, Colin asked me what I'd like to talk about, um, I often start with just a title and not sure quite what it means. <laughs> and then work it out from there. And um, it seemed awfully clever at the time, but it's become a bit of a cliche since, because this was a while ago. Um, and uh, the title I gave it was that to solve the climate crisis, it's all about doing um, everything everywhere all at once, uh, which you might recognise. Yes. Uh, and I'll come back um, to the film in just a moment. And um, the, in fact, right now. And um, it's a fabulous film about the multiverse. Now, if you're not, um, con if, if you're not, um, on, I'll explain briefly about the multiverse in case you haven't dived into this exotic concept. Um, so there is the universe, which we think is more or less sort of a, a single plane of time and everything else, um, and it proceeds. But the multiverse is a really interesting idea. That there's lots of universes all stacked up here that are going on simultaneously. And so somebody can be in any one of those, or many of those universes at any one moment, but it's never quite the same in each of those uh, other universes. And um, so that's why uh, this is such an example. Have some people seen the film? I, I must admit I was getting quite lost at various points and just kind of sat back and sort of wondered at it. Um, and quite an amazing film, though, um, uh, which uh, its hall of seven Oscars is um, uh, a testament to. Um, but long before we got um, that very wonderful film, uh, we, of course, have had the climate crisis. And it's a bit like a multiverse in that it touches everything, everywhere, across our lives and work and society and the natural world um, all at once. And um, so our climate responses need to be as ubiquitous um, and as speedy to try and catch up. But like um, the rest of humanity, we here in Aotearoa are lagging very considerably behind. The crisis is getting away from us. Now, there are some inspiring exceptions here and abroad, um, and I will um, touch on some of those. Um, but the real issue is um, how we conceive of the crisis, uh, what our response is to it um, so far, but what action we should be taking, um, but crucially about leadership. And um, the leadership becomes like that multiverse, really. It's not looking for a single um, class of leadership or type of leadership, um, but um, a very diverse kind of leadership that can work um, across all kinds of ways and in all kinds of situations. So just briefly a recap, and that's where we've been going for the last 140 years or so. Um, and uh, we know exactly what's going on there. Um, Tyndall, the Irish scientist, um, in the 1860s worked out what was going on with uh, climate and CO2 in the atmosphere. And then uh, uh, Svante Arnus, a Swedish scientist, um, in the late 1890s, sort of nailed down all the scientific equations to prove that. Um, um, but we've been um, very um, slow responding, uh, and um, we've got lots of work to do. But crucially, we've got to help um, 
uh, our biggest response has to be helping nature uh, restore and recover itself. Um, Sorry. We know that roughly at least a half or even towards three quarters of our responses to the climate um, can be nature-based solutions. So it's not all about high technology, you know, electric cars and the like, um, but um, nature-based responses. And so the, um, the more we give nature a chance to um, breathe and recover, the more resilient it becomes and the more productive it becomes. And so nature is incredibly important in this. And this is a chart just from two days ago. This extraordinary kick up, it was the highest um, temperature, average temperature across the planet in a day um, that um, we've ever seen. This is, I need to be really clear about this, we've only had uniform measure of that um, across the planet for about the last 50 years. So to say it's the, um, it's the um, uh, most, it's the highest we've seen, we can be pretty sure it, it is ever, but we've actually only had that kind of data in this kind of form for about 50 years. Um, but it's certainly um, a spectacular kick up. And, and in particular, you can see um, all the years from 79 represented in that band, um, but then how last year was an, an anomaly pushing out from that, and how this year the red um, is, is pushing out even further. I think there's probably one little detail that took me by surprise when I saw this chart this morning, was that if you think about the average temperature across the surface of the planet yet, uh, two days ago, it was only 17.18 degrees. So whilst we focus a lot on the very hot places, uh, there's a lot of very cold places, um, and of course there's day and night in various parts. So we could say, oh, 17, that's a pretty good average temperature, how comfortable, a nice uh, Auckland winter's day. Um, but of course, um, that's, uh, we're not concerned so much about the average, we're very much concerned about the high peaks. Um, I'm not going to dive deeply into solutions. This is going to be um, very, um, very thematic here. And um, the first one is um, we won't achieve the responses we need to do unless we set really ambitious goals and we devise very effective policies um, and then create strategies to deliver them. So <coughs> that's a challenge for humanity generally. Um, it gets to be more of a challenge because we've got to do so much uh, at one time. And of course, across um, the whole world, um, there's very uh, great um, variability in capability uh, within societies and between societies. So this has to be very much a cooperative response um, in order to um, bring everybody along on that. And essentially, in those responses, um, four, four broad themes. One is to make sure that all the energy we use are, are clean sources of energy, uh, rather than fossil fuels, because the fossil fuels are, uh, and their emissions are the main driver of climate change. Then we've got to ensure that all of our built environments, uh, our buildings, our, our roads, um, uh, and the like, everything we build, um, is very low carbon in construction. So mm -hmm. concrete and steel are very high carbon, mm -hmm. and the steel industry is working very fast at trying to reduce, work out how to do steel without doing lots of emissions, um, similarly with concrete, but there's a long way to go. Um, and um, there are also very wonderful, um, far more traditional building materials, and I'll give you an example in due course when I get to New Zealand, uh, i.e. Um, the modern evocation of, or expression of timber buildings, uh, which are wonderful because they are very low emissions, uh, virtually none, uh, in their materials, but even better, those materials store carbon, so you get, um, i.e. they will run trees. Um, we've also got to uh, transform farming. Um, our farmers feel that we're picking on them, uh, we're not. Um, this is true across the whole world. So if we look at how we change the use of land and, and change it from, say, a natural forest to farmland, and then how we use that farmland to produce food, 
and then how we process that food, and then how we waste a lot of that food, if we take that whole food cycle, um, it is the largest single source of greenhouse gas emissions. It's not cars, it's not electricity, it's the way we produce food. Um, and so it's not just that um, there is a lot of urgency behind all uh, dairy and um, beef and lamb farmers around the world to reduce the emissions of their animals. Um, rice is a prodigious, rice paddy fields are prodigious producers of methane. Mm -hmm. So when we say to our farmers, look, you've really got to get to work on your animals and find ways to so they produce less methane. At the same time, in um, other countries, um, governments are saying to rice farmers, look, your rice paddies are a real problem. You've got to deal with the methane. And um, so it's really important that farmers um, step up to these challenges because A, we need more food, we need food that is compatible with nature, and we need farmers to do um, something very special, which is to be really good um, custodians, guardians of their land, uh, in order to help nature recover and, um, uh, and help restore biodiversity. So big role for farmers. And then we consumers have to make very good choices about um, how much we consume, uh, the nature of those, um, of those products, and all the rest. Now, what's usually forgotten in, in all this um, about the climate is that um, so many of these issues are interrelated. It, it's not just about clean energy. Um, it's, as I say, it's about farming and, and all these related issues. But usually, when we find a solution to one thing, it gives us uh, other benefits rather than just dealing with the climate impact of that product or, um, or that um, particular activity. And I'll give you some examples. Um, that, uh, and it's really important for us to think about because these crises of nature and climate and resource use and pollution and all the rest are interrelated, we need to make sure that the solutions we use are solving for more than one thing at once. So we get lots of benefits from acting. And I'll give you an example. Um, if our houses are better insulated, um, they are warmer, healthier, and cheaper to run. So we have appalling problems here in New Zealand. Our housing stock is, uh, on average, uh, uh, um, very substandard. And therefore, lots of people, um, uh, and not just in lower income communities, uh, have health consequences of that. Then another benefit is that um, if we are um, having more compact cities um, with um, more people living in um, multi, uh, you know, apartment buildings and the rest, that denser housing creates a much livelier neighbourhoods and much um, greater amenities. And so those communities <coughs> become. Um, as, if, as long as they develop um, well in the, in the spirit of those communities and um, become much more supportive um, and um, uh, affirming for their, their, their people. Um, in built environment, in infrastructure, we saw very clearly um, on anniversary weekend that nature-based solutions to storm water and extraordinary uh, rain incidents like we had that Friday evening um, are much better, better dealt with by um, natural responses. And um, we had some tremendously interesting examples around the city, um, in particular Oakley Creek, um, out at Point Chef, um, which over recent years had been daylighted. Years ago it had been channeled into concrete pipes uh, down alongside Great North Road. Um, and there was always um, significant flooding <coughs> and heavy rain. But over recent years, um, a lot of work has gone on in the old valley there um, to create parks that could easily um, take storm water. The water would overflow onto, uh, onto um, playing fields and into other areas, but then quickly drain from them. And um, so there was far less... Um, um, stormwater damage in Oakley Creek this uh, anniversary weekend 
than there had been in um, previous storm um, surges going back um, decades. There were some tremendous examples on the North Shore as well. So those natural-based solutions um, uh, are a wonderful way to deal with these more intense weather events. Um, and, and as I say, Oakley Creek um, is a good example of that. But then if we have sort of green infrastructure, generally um, more amenities, um, you know, more delightful places, um, more trees, um, having more nature in the city um, brings a lot of health benefits to it, a uh, feeling of well-being um, and the like. Um, this is all very clearly identified. And then when we get into transport, um, if we um, electric vehicles reduce pollution and traffic noise and they um, cheaper to run, still more expensive to buy, but cheaper to run than petrol and diesel cars, um, public transport reduces emissions and traffic congestion, and then active transport is the uh, phrase that's used for walking and cycling, um, are um, very much also increased personal health and well-being. So if we start to design our cities and, and rebuild our cities in ways that create these kinds of communities, create these kinds of infrastructure, and um, those are much healthier places to live. So that's what co-benefits look like. And we never ever take those into our government, never ever take those, other governments fail too, never ever take those into those co-benefit calculations um, into the analysis they do on whether they can afford to do something. It's completely crazy. They look only at the cost of doing something um, and are very, very poor at trying to work out uh, what the benefit of doing something is. So um, uh, co-benefits is a, a really important um, uh, thing. But also, uh, we know there's great um, inequalities socially and economically and in other ways. And this is a harder case to make. Um, um, in terms of offering you know, concrete evidence. But I think there is a real sign of, uh, the signs of optimism that if we um, did um, progress in this way with co-benefits like this, we would end up with a healthier, more equitable um, society. Um, and um, that's certainly a wonderful thing to be aiming for. But how are we doing? Um, there is a, on this, there is a wonderful organization of scientists called Climate Action Tracker, which analyzes each country's commitments and policies. And um, this is um, their page on us. Um, and um, I'll just give you the highlights. Our overall rating is um, that it's... Uh, um, our current policies and actions are highly insufficient and they are consistent with a four degree centigrade rise in temperature. Now we're trying to keep it to one and a half degrees, but what we're doing at the moment here in New Zealand would be consistent with ending up with a four degree temperature rise. Right? So we're that far off the mark. And it's not like one and a half to four is kind of double. This is kind of exponential. You know, two is a lot worse than one and a half, and by the time you get to four, it's a catastrophe. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, I won't dwell on all the detail here, but it's insufficient, highly insufficient, poor, um, we think it's bad use of forestry, and it's having sink rather than other benefits too. And um, so it looks like this. Um, that's where we should be going, and that's our, the target we've committed to with other countries in the Paris Agreement. But the policies we have in place and the actions we're taking we're going there. So that's exactly where we're heading at the moment. And there, there are lots of other countries that are similarly struggling. I'm, I'm not picking on us. Um, but of course, it's each country's responsibility to respond uh, best it can. So we have a whole process of the Zero Carbon Act. We have carbon budgets that the Climate Change Commission advises the government on. And the government says, Oh yes, okay, in the first emissions budget, um, out to 2025, we'll cut emissions to this, and then to that, and then to that. Well, that's how we're tracking. You know, we're missing those budgets uh, entirely. Now, there was a really fascinating story in newsroom today. 
declaration. I'll be right for you, sir. Uh, this is um, my um, uh, good friend and colleague, Mark Dolder. And this is um, really fascinating analysis um, using data from um, Ipsos, the global um, uh, public opinion and surveying company, um, on climate responses. And um, this is... Uh, this, I'll, I'll, I'll make a PDF of this available if anybody who wants it, and it obviously writing here is too small to read, um, if you, even if you're in the front row. So basically, um, this is um, the percentage of respondents who agree or strongly agree with statements such as, now is not the right time to be investing in measures to reduce climate change given tough economic conditions. Well, about 30% of New Zealand has said that, similar to the world. And then there are all these other things. There's no point in um, me changing my behaviour because that's not going to make any difference to all this. Mm -hmm. And climate change is beyond our control. It's already too late to think about it. And the negative uh, impact of climate change is too far off in the future to be me to be worried about. So I, I, I hope that there are some people who are saying agreeing with various of those statements because that adds up to um, more than. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Most of the projectors worried. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, and now uh, this is where it got really fascinating. So it was asking people, um, what, what are the main responses of New Zealand? Well, the main responses to New Zealand is, I'm going to recycle. Now, recycling is a really, really, really good thing to do because it's far more rational use of the resources we borrow from nature. We should be returning to nature rather than just putting in the tip. So recycling is great. So 45% um, uh, percent of people think that's fantastic um, and think that's a really good thing to do. But if you line up all the things you can do as an individual to act on climate, on a list of 1 to 60, recycling is 60. No. Right? It, it actually doesn't make much difference Keep doing it, it's, but it doesn't actually make any much difference on climate. So this is all the way through. Um, switching to uh, purchasing renewable energy, that's good, that's pretty high. Um, but so many of the other activities we have, like um, less packaging or buying fewer items or more durable items, rank very low on, on, on the activities that we can do that will actually help to reduce the climate change. And um, so when we come over to the other side, uh, way down the list, because you go all the way down the list and you come down here, if you uh, end up not having a car, a bit hard to do in Auckland, easier to do in some places, um, but that's actually the number one thing you could do. Um, but it's kind of like way down the list for New Zealanders. Um, and not having pets was kind of interesting. <laughs> I like cats and dogs. I'm not, uh, but anyway, it's all right. It's not that big a thing. <laughs> um, so it's really fascinating. Uh, this to me was a real shock today because I thought I was around and about a lot and, and talking to lots of people. Um, um, and I'm assuming that this data is reasonably reliable. Certainly, Ipsos is a really um, serious organisation and. Um, based on this study uh, around the world, uh, and the, the, this New Zealand data was drawn from, it's a really interesting academic paper that lies behind this. Um, actually, we're still not getting the messages across um, in New Zealand that there is still time to do things. There's lots of things we can do. They aren't all painful or expensive, but you've got to make some good choices. Um, and um, to me, this was a, a, a real shock. Just um, moving on to uh, a couple of, um, th that's enough of where, where we're at. Um, in terms of people, helping people understand what's going on, um, I'm a, a huge um, fan of work uh, that's been going on for many years uh, out of um, the Stockholm Resilience Centre called the Planetary Boundaries. And um, Johan Rockström, who leads that work, um, last year did a wonderful documentary with David Attenborough called Breaking the Boundaries, uh, which is um, still on Netflix and in this wonderful book. 
And, and so it's about all this, and they kind of rush it towards the end, but they do get on to things we can do, to things, solutions. And um, if people are looking for a handy guide to help us understand that the multi-parted nature of all this, um, then that's um, one of my favorites. I couldn't resist this. <laughs> now, I had heard a long time ago that uh, Margaret Thatcher, in 1989, um, gave a speech to the United Nations about climate. And I'd never actually looked it up. But for a piece of work I was doing uh, the other day, I did look it up. And I was completely enthralled by it, <laughs> which is why I put this speech text and the video is quite fascinating to watch. This is um, um, September of 1989, and she is absolutely... This is a Margaret Thatcher that I was not experiencing in London at the time. <laughs> this was the magnificent stateswoman, who really importantly, her professional training was as an industrial chemist. Mm -hmm. she, she was Dr. Thatcher, and she worked in industry, so she understood the science perfectly. This is the most extraordinary speech you could kind of give it today in terms of, uh, of what it's saying about climate. But what fascinates me about it, she's so completely on top of the subject and speaking so magnificently to her fellow world leaders. And meanwhile, back in the UK, mayhem is breaking down. <laughs> you know, this is well past the, you know, the miners' um, mayhem and everything else. Uh, and um, um, she's already losing control of her party. And she only survived about another 18 months in power before John Major took over. Um, so I found it quite a fascinating thing that um, when political leaders are realizing their time is up at home, they step onto the world stage <laughs> and uh, bask of glory while they still have access. Having said that, though, it is actually an astonishingly good speech. Now, one last thing on this section. Um, this is... Um, a glacier in Iceland called Ok Jokul, uh, the Ok Glacier. And um, a few years ago, um, the people of Iceland put a plaque on the top um, which says, A letter to the future. Ok is the first Icelandic glacier to lose its status as a glacier. In the next 200 years, all our glaciers are expected to follow the same path. This monument is to acknowledge that we know what is happening and what needs to be done, only you know if we did it. Wow. And that was uh, dated August 2019. Wow. And, and I just thought that, that that was quite inspired. And in fact, um, if you get the PDF and you want to dive into all this, this is a, a fabulous um, um, uh, not Ock movie. Uh, it's um, a, a documentary um, about that. And um, I, um, I actually find it very moving because it's um, that sense of wonder of nature. Obviously, the glaciers are terribly important to Iceland. It's all part of their identity. Um, and um, what's happening globally is completely beyond their control. What they're doing is impressive um, uh, in their own way. Um, but I think that commitment intergenerationally um, is something that we would all be um, very wise to um, pick up. Um, I won't say too much more about action. I, I've touched on the main themes. And I could talk a lot about our natural environment in New Zealand, which is a really important one, because uh, our islands that we live on, um, in Aotearoa, they were the last large landmass to be settled by humans. Only about 30 to 35 generations ago. Yet, we've pulled off one of the fastest degradation of ecosystems and species loss that most countries have achieved. Mm. Others have done it more slowly. We've done it really fast over the last couple hundred years. And so, um, I think we have a huge responsibility given the very spectacular, unique ecosystems and species we have here. Um, we can't bring back who we are. We can't bring back the dead one, the, the extinct species. Um, but to make sure we lose no more, um, but to make sure we give nature a chance to 
it won't go back to its pristine state, it will go off in a different direction, but hopefully a, a healthy one. And so we are unique in that uh, last landmass to be settled so recently, fastest degradation, but crucially, crucially, the most full, intact body of indigenous knowledge, thanks to Māori and to, to our Māori worldview of that interdependence, of probably any indigenous um, uh, culture. And because of that very short time frame, it, it is completely within um, you know, current um, Māori knowledge and culture. So I think we have some extraordinary opportunities here in Aotearoa to address this. And I could spend the whole time talking about nature, but I wanted to talk about towns and cities, not the least of which is because we live in New Zealand's largest. Um, but um, it, to me, there's a really important concept here that in our towns and cities, we have to bring nature back into our built environments in very profound ways. So not just you know a nice little garden out back or some trees down the side of the road, um, but um, making sure that um, nature is helping us um, um, produce energy, produce food and other resources you know, within our cities. And then cities become far more delightful and inspiring places to live and work. And to help us restore our relationship with nature, our relationship with ecosystems. So we don't need to go out to a national park or a wilderness area um, to um, develop that bond, with, you know, to, to strengthen that relationship with nature. Um, but it's just a natural part of our daily life um, in, in cities. And I say that and, and now, <laughs> Lynn and I live you know, right in the heart of the city downtown, um, rather than leafy Mission Bay. One of my favorite organizations uh, is called Biophilic Cities. So these are cities that love um, bio biology. And um, these are cities that are very focused on just that concept of bringing nature back into the cities. And um, Wellington is the only New Zealand member of that uh, global network. And even in all of Australia, Fremantle is the only one. But they're, they're wonderfully interesting cities. Some of them are very old cities. My, the town I was born in and grew up in, Birmingham in the UK, a very industrial city. Thanks to the foresight of its Victorian um, industrial <coughs> benefactors like the Cadbury family and others. And there are tremendous parks in the city mm. and that um, are proving to be the real backbones of Birmingham trying to become a biophilic city as it is. So it's a really fascinating movement. Um, and um, another example is um, Paris is greening at a great rate of knots. And um, that's partially construction of that uh, all timber building with a leafy exterior um, behind it. And then um, another really important concept is the 15 minute city. So wherever you live in a city, um, um, a, as much as possible of your, your work, your recreation, your shopping, um, uh, your social life is within about 15 minutes of either active transport, walking or cycling, or public transport. And so the city is compact and, and you're not wasting lots of time sitting in cars, uh, but you are enjoying the city. Now, Paris is very good at this. Anybody want to hazard a guess which New Zealand city is really onto this? Christchurch. No, Christchurch has got worse since the rebuild. It's now mm -hmm. less dense. Dunedin. No. Sorry, it, I, I'm going to fast forward this because it's in. It's quite close to us um, in the North Island. Yeah. Hamilton. <laughs> Hamilton. Hamilton um, is working on the 20 minute city, and. Um, they um, were developing this program when the government had it shut already stuff for COVID. And they didn't get a single, I'm getting so cross with the government, they didn't get a single penny for all the fantastic projects they worked up. Uh, but still, they are pressing ahead with it. And um, so the Tron might yet be um, quite a fascinating thing. Now, just briefly on timber buildings, of course, Cyan is the Forestry Crown Research Institute, 
so they know their tin as well. But this is their now relatively new headquarters. It's a couple of years old uh, in the Fakawera forest uh, at Rotorua. It is an absolutely sensational building. Um, and it's not just because it's mostly timber, but there is um, fabulous symbolism and imagery. I, I won't, well, these are the three hapu on whose land um, they um, are tenants. Um, all sorts of wonderful imagery like that. And um, it's, um, th that's a public cafe in there, so next time you're in Rotorua, pop in to experience it. But this is just such a glorious example of what um, a timber building looks like. The ceiling panels are wood, um, but they replicate the DNA pattern of Pinus radiata in, in terms of the motif of it. I mean, there's just so much fantastic attention to detail uh, that makes it um, such a, a glorious place. This, to me, is the most important building in the country. This is uh, in uh, Taniatua, um, uh, and it's uh, Tuhoi's uh, tribal headquarters, uh, Takura Fare. And um, there is this incredibly demanding international um, certification for buildings, um, if they can prove they are self-sufficient for energy and water, can become registered as living buildings. And this gorgeous building was the first living building in New Zealand. And um, it was a statement by Tuhoi after they did their treaty settlement, after they uh, um, got that guardianship of the Tuhuruweras. Um, they wanted to give a 21st, they wanted to find a 21st century expression of what it means to be an iwi. Um, and this building is it. And uh, I visited it on a number of occasions. And, and it's a gorgeous, gorgeous building. But it, the most important thing about this building is that there are living buildings all over the world now. Not many, but it's quite a few. But this looks like no other living building. It's the expression of Tuhoi. It's the expression of who we are in New Zealand. Really important idea there that, you know, we might end up with an EV that looks as though it came from a Chinese factory, which it probably did. Um, but... Um, so the cars won't we look much different. Um, but we should, be, we should be taking these opportunities to give expression of who we are um, as we deal with these things. Um, Jazzmax was, um, was the main architect, yeah. And um, Jerome Partington at Jazzmax was the person who drove um, the whole... Well, sorry, it was a very collaborative exercise for two people in terms of design and particular materials, because almost all those materials have come locally. Um, it's very, when you ask some questions about them, they get rather vague about what came from the inside of the old National Park and what came from outside. Um, 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 it's, it's, right. uh, it's good. Um, and so, yes, um, but from a, a kind of a technical point of view, uh, largely chestnuts. So now we get on to leadership. Let me first deal with the people who aren't. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> we've got to be engaged in a process that goes on for decades. So we've got to have real long-term agreement and consistency about what we're trying to do. Because we need that to drive all this. But that, in turn, needs enduring political commitment across parties. Uh, and consistency of goals and policies and incentives. Well, that's completely absent. So, for example, um, if we go back almost, more than 20 years, Helen Clark fought the 1996 election, I think, on a commitment that New Zealand would sign the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, and then finally, at the end of her nine years as Prime Minister, she did get the emissions trading scheme in place. Um, but very hard work, um, a very long time uh, coming through all that. But this Labour government started with a reasonably strong lead, um, but has in the last year become very short term focused on the election, has binned some very effective policies like the clean car discount, has kneecapped the emissions trading scheme, and it just plainly won't deal with the hard issues. 
Um, national uh, won't. I actually think it's probably can't, because they don't have these head around lists at all, articulate integrated, full picture, and they come up with very piecemeal and contradictory proposals, and they won't touch farmers. Uh, um, ACT um, has reduced this all to a, a very simple excuse. Uh, all we need is a price on carbon, and then everything else will follow. That is absolutely not true, because you have to have a whole bunch of other policies in place. Um, you have to have um, higher um, um, energy efficiency standards and, and all kinds of other things. It is not just all about the price of power. The Greens uh, have the deepest and best knowledge, but they're hugely hamstrung by their politics, both internally within the caucus, um, but then externally, in that they, um, they could play a really powerful brokerage role um, uh, if they were prepared to talk to national um, in forming a coalition government, because um, they, the Greens at this next election, will once again hand, have a useful number of MPs uh, that would be a great bargaining chip um, to um, get um, an agreement with the leader of the party leading a new government uh, to make some great progress on them. But they, they won't, they just won't talk to national tour. Um, uh, to Pati Mari, yes, they're committed to climate and they have lots of knowledge to offer, but they're generally um, preoccupied by many other political battles, and then New Zealand first is, well, <laughs> focused on the narrow and base. And I think it's really fascinating that Winston Peters has been so silent. Um, he's legally brought in the for his final run. <laughs> so I'm not sure they're going to be a, a factor at all. But that's basically, not basically, that's, that's the scorecard. However, there is political leadership elsewhere. And um, uh, this is one of my um, favorite examples. Um, it's called Climate Shift. And it's a bunch of uh, 40 um, NGOs that launched this just um, a few weeks ago. So it's a very, very integrated um, set of policies. Um, and um, I refreshed this picture this afternoon, so they're now up to 11,000, almost 200 people signed up. And there's a link to them. And uh, they're an amazing array. No surprise, Forest and Bird and Greenpeace and Oxfam. Um, um, but um, I won't dwell on, on all of them. Um, but it's people like the Sustainable um, Business Network. And <coughs> everybody who's got a Kiwi Saver should be looking at Mindful Money to check out their Kiwi Saver plans to see how much fossil fuels there are in there and everything else. can actually um, cross political boundaries you know, and show that we don't need to be politically tribal about this. And this is on the question of um, do we... Um, put a tax on uh, heavy um, consumed cars and trucks and the less of which are heavy consumers of fossil fuels and then use that money as a rebate on clean mm -hmm. vehicles. Farmers and the Act Party, the National Act, call the U tax, but of course it applies to more vehicles than use. Um, and um, if we look at this data, we find that um, almost 70% of us say we have some concern of varying degrees about climate across the political spectrum. And then when we ask them, do you think it's a good idea um, that we have a fee on polluting vehicles as a good policy? Um, so half of New Zealand first, more than half of Maori, obviously Greens think it's a good idea. National's not far back from 50%. So there's regional support all the way across there. And um, then um, should the uh, should there be a clean, uh, you know, help buying clean cars? Well, everybody likes that, even members of the Act Party. <laughs> um, so never look a little subsidy in the face when, you know, anyway. Um, so this is a really interesting example where you can construct policies um, that does have, does have wide appeal um, and does um, um, reach well across um, party lines. Uh, which I think is a very, very important uh, thing to do. But here's the thing. Politicians, particularly in, thankfully, a democracy, 
and um, know that they can only um, move as far or as fast um, as um, the political support is there for them. <coughs> and therefore, we have to give, you know, we have to demand of our politicians that they deliver far better climate policies than they're doing. So we are actually the leaders, not the politicians. The politicians are there as our servants. And, and we've got to um, show that we really care about the stuff and we really want them to get their act together on things like the clean discount. And that, so we should, be, we should be pursuing our enlightened self-interest um, uh, as long as it's enlightened. There's some self-interest in this thing. Um, um, but there's lots of things that we can do um, that is good for us, uh, but it's good for the planet. And then we, the public, um, need to get across this message that the co-benefits of this uh, of achieving these climate opportunities are tremendous. And that we need to be the leaders of the political discourse, not the politicians. Um, wherever we get together, we need to be finding ways to talk about this, and particularly you know, with people from different parties. We need to find the common ground. Uh, we need to create a new constructive and political dialogue. Now, I'm just going to offer you a few um, examples of people who I think are terrifically good at this. Uh, I haven't put everybody in here. I'm a great fan of Action Station, for example. Um, but this is a new organization uh, founded by three very impressive young women called Climate Club Aotearoa. And if you sign up to them, um, their frequent newsletters will, they have little segments like, if you've only got five minutes today, here's some things you can do on climate. If you think you could spare an hour, well, here's some more things. They are completely fabulous, these are the three, uh, Emily, uh, Dania, and, and, Jan, uh, and Jenny. Um, I'm a huge fan of what they do. And um, it's no surprise to me that they're younger, or women. Um, I, I think those are two advantages in this. Uh, <laughs> all the people are men. So it rules me out, doesn't it? Um, um, but anyway, Climate Club Aotearoa um, is um, a very, very inspiring. We offer help, uh, not only in our normal news, but we have a, a Sustainable Future newsletter uh, every Friday. Um, and with Mark and Dave Williams, the three of us taking in turns to edit that uh, a week at a time. But here's the real thing. The ultimate test for all of us, for everything we do, is this. Sorry, the little terms and conditions. Um, <laughs> just so you do it. Just so you do This is deliberately small, not to shock you. So you shouldn't be sitting in the front row. The terms and conditions are, uh, um, the ultimate test is, and your answer, the fate of humanity hangs on your, our answers, is that um, are we working with nature or are we working against nature? And however complicated the climate thing is, we can usually answer that question reasonably well. And I think it's a really, really good question to ask ourselves. Because if we are conscious of that and about our relationship with the living earth, our life support system, and then um, we then start making much better decisions. Um, I vivid, vividly remember um, uh, an occasion I was doing nine to noon with Catherine Ryan where the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change had produced their first one and a half degree report and Catherine and I were discussing it. And she said, but, but you know, can, can we do this? Can, can we do enough? And I, 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 I knew the conversation was going to go along those lines. So I, I decided I was going to out myself for the first time publicly uh, on 9 to noon. And I said, you won't <laughs> do enough until we care enough. And we won't care enough until we have some sort of spiritual relationship uh, with the living earth. Now you can define that however broadly you want. It could be your faith. Um, it could be just how you feel when you 
go for a walk in the forest, in the bush. Um, <laughs> that's completely non prescriptive. We, we need to sense some kind of relationship. And that's why I find so fascinating to Al Mari and, and that Mari worldview of that interdependence and of that, those reciprocal responsibilities. And um, so that's, that's the first time I used the S word um, <laughs> to an unknown large public audience. <laughs> I sort of discussed it with others before. So that was October 2018. Oh. And I just, um, I'm almost done, but um, for a, a piece of work I was doing last night, I um, was looking up a, a blessing with which I could uh, finish this webinar. Uh, and of course, Matariki is only um, eight days away, um, next Friday night. And it turned out, um, and I should have known this, um, our Anglican diocese here in Auckland um, had, I found this Matariki liturgies, and um, that's a clip, uh, that's a link to this page, and then down the bottom is a link to the um, liturgies themselves. And um, what I used was this blessing uh, at, um, which is the end of um, this um, second liturgy, the Nativity of uh, Sir John the, um, John the Baptist uh, in midwinter. And I'll just leave you to um, read that, if you'd like to. generations. It's a huge liability. Um, when, and it makes no sense because we're having such tremendous technological advances on genuinely clean energy, clean not only in its production but in its whole life cycle, um, that nuclear is just, we shouldn't even entertain it. But you could argue there are parts of the world that don't have access to clean energy. But they will, uh, and they are, and it's an awful lot cheaper than nuclear. That's the thing. So um, wind, um, solar, those can go most places. And uh, we still got lots of work to do on the technology of storing electricity. But um, there are so many fields opening up there, technologically, um, that I'm very convinced those issues will be solved. Um, in ways that we can never ever solve the problem of um, nuclear waste. Sure. Uh, you, there's nothing you, you can do with a bit of reprocessing of some nuclear materials. Um, but basically, the most toxic of all uses have to leave there for eons, really. So I, I'm afraid it, it should be completely off the table. Um, so I don't, I, 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 if I go there next and then next and then, then thanks. Oh, you, you mentioned the IPCC. Yes. Um, what's your assessment? I mean, it's the only sort of international lever that we've got, really, isn't it? 
what's your assessment as to the sort of efficacy of the IPCC? Um, in itself, um, it is very good. Um, obvious, <coughs> sorry, uh, let me feel, explain that judgment. It is very good because it is a very, very robust scientific process by which um, evidence is collected and evaluated. There is a downside to it that every IPCC report, every single line has to be agreed by everybody, which gets to be a real nightmare. Um, and it means that um, inevitably the report, while it can offer a range of scenarios, so you could still get uh, the, the more challenging scenarios in there, <coughs> when it comes down to um, conden condensing, so you get this big thing called assessment report, we're going now up to number six, it's huge, multiple volumes, multiple reports, there is a summary for policy makers, um, which is where governments focus most of their attention. So when you get down to the um, um, summary for policy makers, um, that's where um, some of that sense of urgency is lost. However, I think that's a small price to pay because you can still feed that in other ways in order to have that really rock solid um, scientific basis. And um, here in New Zealand, we've got an amazing track record of um, IPCC authors. Um, you know, pro proportional to the, our small population, we contribute a lot of them. We have some very good scientists who devote so much time and effort to that unpaid work. It's completely extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big fan of the IPCC. So, now there are other leaders. Um, the, uh, also within the United Nations is, of course, um, the United Nations Framework on um, Climate Change, UNFCCC, <coughs> Framework Convention on Climate Change. And that's best known by its annual gathering of all the nations of the world, the Conference of Parties. So we're heading for COP28 in Dubai um, at the end of November. Uh, very controversial because Dubai is the third of all the petro states. Its expansion plans for uh, oil and gas are the third largest. Um, However, uh, I've now been to two COPs in a row and will be going to Dubai. Um, there's always a lot of anxiety about COP because they don't, it seems to be very hard to agree to anything. Um, and you know, this goes on for a couple of weeks and it becomes this brinksmanship as to whether anything's going to be agreed by the end. But again, it's really important to remember two things about COP. Again, because it's the United Nations, everything has to be agreed by everybody. So, for example, in Egypt last year, by the end, they finally did um, make some real progress on uh, loss and damage and support for <coughs> developing countries. But that meant that Russia and China and the United States and the EU actually all agreed to that, even though Russia's at war with Ukraine and its supporters. Um, so don't expect COP to be a place of um, blazing ambitions that are racing ahead of everybody else. It's about, COP is about bringing everybody along on the journey. The other thing about COP is, it's not just this once a year thing. There is this amazing series of work programs on every conceivable climate issue you can imagine. Um, that is ongoing to spread knowledge, to uh, help countries um, skill up and become informed. And um, in the last two COPs, I've sat in on some of those work, uh, working group conversations, and it's completely extraordinary. There, there was one uh, last year um, in Egypt where it was, a, you know, it was the first Saturday morning and it was still quite a quiet COP. This was one of the Sorry, um, Mexico was holding out on something. I never quite figured out what it was. Um, and um, there was this amazing series of 
um, um, comments, interventions, speeches, short ones by people from a whole range of other countries um, trying to encourage Mexico to agree to this agenda item so that the agenda could then progress. And um, a very uh, extraordinary young, uh, young to me, Norwegian woman who was chairing that session, it was all in English, um, was um, um, just amazingly skillful at trying to, to facilitate those conversations. So that, to me, is, is the unsung side of COP that, and the United Nations framework that people don't see. So we have these things in place, and they are fantastically important because they um, achieve cohesion globally, which is pretty amazing considering the difference of views between countries and everything else. Um, but we can't look, those bodies do hugely important work, but they can never be the trailblazers. Right? So the trailblazers have to bubble up within communities, within countries, you know, within an industry um, that take those very strong leadership roles. That's why climate leadership has to be an individual responsibility. I am responsible for my climate impact. But also uh, an exercise very much in collective and shared leadership. Um, whether it's you know, within your church or within your community or within your place of work or whether it's at your country scale, however big your country is. And um, so that's why we have to think of all these issues in terms of great strength and great depth and breadth across all of society. Sorry, that was a very long answer. <laughs> um, I, I, I think about that a lot. And it was really interesting last night. Um, the webinar I was involved in was the fourth one we've had with the Religious Diversity Centre that we've organised on the planet. And the series was called uh, Building a Climate of Hope. And um, um, uh, Helen Clark was our main speaker for this last session last night. We'd actually recorded last Friday because she was about to go overseas again. Um, but um, Helen was re really um, interested on, on all this given her national and international experience. And um, that, uh, and we had three wonderful panelists, three wonderful respondents. And um, so if you go to the Religious, the Religious Diversity Centre website, um, <coughs> by early next week you'll see that fourth episode there. I can thoroughly recommend the other three as well. Um, and, um, but that was part of the discussion with Helen uh, that we were airing last night. So I promise over here and I promise thank you for your time so. Thank you for your presentation. I, was, I had a question about the unen, unenlightened souls because the, you know, uh, here we have, you know, we're an engaged church, you know, we have people that, you know, upper middle class, you know, engaged, you know, like university types or just intellectual types. But there's a lot of New Zealanders that are, they love their mates, they love their stay, um, they love their four-wheel drives, um, and they, especially like farmer types, you know, they they see this as a woke, you know, it's yep. the church of the woke, yeah, yeah. you know, and, um, you know, th that's part of the reason, like, la Labour would like to make changes, but they have to see New Zealanders as they are, not as they, as we would like them to be. You know, how do we get people, um, even, and even Christians, I've, I've talked to Christians mm -hmm. and they're like, well, I want to have lots of children, we're going to have, you know, all, you know the, 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 they don't want to be vegan, they don't want, they don't, they don't want to go on public transport, uh, they, don't, they don't want to be educated about, you know, um, you know, like climate change actions, they want to continue their nostalgic trajectory. How do we change these tough nuts, you know? How do we get them into uh, uh, enlightenment? Um, slowly. <laughs> <laughs> Over time. Um, but the crucial thing is not to um, make the mistake of letting them set the agenda. Right? So it's a question of enough other people being able to move things on. They'll eventually cotton on. They may not. Um, um, not everybody will come along on the journey. Um, but um, 
the crucial, crucial thing is <coughs> that a very you know, minorities like that, we have to make sure we build broad coalitions, mm -hmm. and so the broad coalition can advance and not let a, a, a small minority um, stop things in their track. Mm -hmm. And I think over time, you know, people, many people, not all, um, we all have members in our own family that resolutely believe mm -hmm. the same thing today that they believe for ever. Um, uh, you know, with enough exposure, um, with enough encouragement, um, with uh, enough um, understanding of what's to be gained, mm -hmm. um, I, I think you know people can change. Mm -hmm. um, but as I say, crucially, crucially, they can't set the agenda. Mm -hmm. um, it has to be what. Um, the, a, a much larger majority of us would go on to the need. I'm very conscious of that in the church context because um, in the Anglican Church, I mean, I, I'm now done my dash at um, Diocesan Synod and General Synod, and that was a, more, more than a few years ago now. Um, but there were some pretty amazingly entrenched forces there, um, mm -hmm. particularly in General Synod. Um, and a particular diocese, um, and it just took endless patience to um, try to progress things. Well, we did, but it, it, it takes more patience than I usually have. Sorry, I could be keeping you waiting a long time. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, uh, a quick statement and, and then a quick question. Um, I'm the Oraki Local Board lead on um, water quality and environment. One thing that I've noticed about all the environment groups that we have in this particular area, of which there are many, mm. um, is that, that most of the people that go out and do the stuff, the planting and what have you, I, I have to say, uh, um, are of a certain age yes. um, and of a certain ethnicity. Um, and I look around and I worry that, you know, where are all our younger sort of eco-warriors? Because, you know, I, I, there are 81-year-olds who are almost, as we're speaking, going yeah. out trapping yeah. Yeah. today. And which leads on to the next question. Um, I was interested in your, in your little um, sort of, you know, 1 to 50 about, you know, what action mm. you can take. Now, the, the first one you said was basically drop your car. But I was wondering, you know, what, what, are, the, what are the top seven? Because I wonder, I mean, I didn't know that drop it, you know, if, you, if we just left all of us left our cars at home tomorrow, impossible in Auckland, but if we did, that would actually make a huge difference from what, you know, from what you said. So what are the top seven? And then, talking about communication, how do we communicate that out to you know, the, the wider, the wider good sort of thing. Yes, I can't rattle off the seven because that was a new list to be today oh, okay. from that study. Uh, and I've only had the, the one peek at it. Um, but um, um, that is a big one. Uh, sorry, cars are a big one. Um, changing of diets really is a big one. Mm -hmm. um, but like all of these things, it, it's not about going cold turkey. You don't need to give up your car Tomorrow. seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. Yeah. Um, maybe, as we used to do when there was fuel rationing, we might leave the car at home one day uh, a week or plan our lives and we don't take the car out that day. That's progress. Um, in terms of food, um, there's a lot to be said to just being um, not a vegan or a vegetarian, but just a reductionarian. <laughs> and, and, and you just find yourself gradually eating less meat and dairy products. You, you, you broaden your cuisine and your diet and, and feel more adventurous about when you go out to a restaurant. <coughs> and um, um, because those of us of reason maker um, in countries like New Zealand, um, we do eat more meat and dairy products than we need. Um, and um, so we 
so we need to make a big fuss about this. Right. Just just gradually swing over to something else. So you're on you're on a journey. So that to me is so food is a big one, but you don't have to all of a sudden become a vegetarian. Mm. Um, how you, um, he, even though a lot of our electricity, 80% or so of our electricity is clean, um, we are still wasting a great deal of energy um, in our houses um, because our, most houses are very poorly insulated. Mm. So I, I'll give an example of the house that we lived in, in um, Lynn and I lived in for 26 years in Mission Bay, a house built in the 1940s. Um, when we started to get really serious about its energy efficiency um, in 2012, we'd, we'd already started by putting solar water heating panels on the roof. And, and I was utterly flawed when we analysed how much gas we were using for hot air heating in the winter. Mm. And the carbon impact of that was huge because the gas was really cheap. Mm. And, and it was a big shock. And um, so we did a lot of work on the house and put solar panels on the roof in 2013. So we were generating enough electricity for um, two of us and charging an electric car. And we, were he and we did a lot on, in terms of double glazing and improving the efficiency of the house. And um, in the middle of winter, we were only spending a couple of dollars a day to heat the house. Um, so, um, so those are the sorts of journeys you can be on. And that was quite difficult to do 10 years ago. It's a lot easier to do now. Um, the technology has improved, uh, more people are offering it. It's all better understood. Um, so um, houses would be another big thing. Um, but I'm sorry, I can't rattle off the seven. Yeah. But going back to your other point, which is a really good one, um, that uh, about who turns up to plant, um, I, um, um, through the Religious Diversity Centre, uh, I know of a, a fabulous group of um, young, very passionate Sikhs in the Waikato, uh, men and women, um, very strong in their faith, who are fantastic tree planters. So, <laughs> so don't worry, at least in the Waikato, there was young Sikh tree planters. Um, um, and um, whilst there are young planters around, uh, I also think that um, young people can often be very busy with their own careers and lives to be able to get out and do stuff. Um, can I just pick, sorry, that triggers a, a point that's been on my mind a lot. It is about young people, because this was really coming through very strongly in this four-part webinar series. And I found my, because we were asking every, the type, the theme of the series was building uh, a climate of hope. And so uh, we, we were asking everybody on the webinar, so what gives you hope? And time and again, and I said it myself, it's young people, mm. which is true. But that's incredibly unfair, because I feel that we older people have largely given up. Um, you know, we're set in our ways, our time is almost up, it's not our future that we're trying to protect. And, and we're saying, oh, look at these fantastic young people, they're so onto it, and they just care to... They are wrecks, emotionally and otherwise, many of them, because of this. And, um, one of the people we had on last night, Bronwyn Hayward, who's a political scientist down in Christchurch. She's very good on young people and climate. She's also an IPCC author. And um, Nikki Hare here at the university, um, a psychologist, um, she was on a, one of my um, video episodes this past year on climate anxiety. Um, young people are suffering terribly um, from this because they're feeling the burden because we who are supposed to be in charge aren't. Right? So we're just sort of saying, oh, look at these fantastic young people. You know, we'll leave it all to them. Well, you can leave it all to us if you give us the power to do stuff, but then you deny us the power to do it. So, you know, you can't have this both ways. So I just had to get off that chest. So, yes, to be terribly supportive of young people, 
I feel that's the the best and thing I enjoy most of all the things I do. Um, but we've still got to take responsibility um, for um, what we are doing and for what we're not doing. Right? Mm -hmm. And, and you scoop up their energy, push it to great use, um, but don't just leave them without the power um, to um, say it well. It's your future, you better sort it out for yourself. <coughs> <coughs> yes. Um, a lot of these solutions are accessible only to a group, certain group of people, privileged, privileged people. So, how do we help those who can't afford to get an electric car but need to drive from you know, South Auckland to get to their jobs, which are important to all the rest of us, or can't afford to, you know, buy certain things at the supermarket or whatever, how do we help those people? Because a lot of this stuff is great, but it's not it's not attainable for many people. Yeah. Um, fundamentally, of course, the theme of through all this is just transitions, mm. um, so that it is fair on everybody, mm. regardless of <coughs> their resources and where they are in society. And... Um, we are doing very little on that. There was one example of a, a car purchase or leasing scheme for hybrid and EVs um, in South Auckland that our Kina Foundation um, uh, got off the ground and, and it used the government's clean car subsidy. To, um, but then when the government tightened up on that, um, the scheme fell apart. Mm -hmm. So that's a very good example of the government doing a good thing and then withdrawing a good thing. Um, so uh, there's huge work to do to make sure that there is very, very wide access and help for, mm -hmm. for people. But on top of that, <coughs> or, or sort of, sorry, on top of that, um, sort of a, a, a foundation for that is um, there are still things that people can do, even on limited budgets, and, with, and it's very hard for them to, you know, they, it's so hard for them to just keep the family show on the road as it is, <laughs> um, that they hardly have a moment to think about trying to do anything different. Um, but there are still things that we can all do that um, have minimal or no cost. You know, bring a benefit to us. But we, we need to do a huge education effort mm -hmm. um, to get that, that message mm -hmm. out there. Um, I'm a, a great fan of Auckland Council's um, climate uh, crisis response report or, or program, came out a few years ago. Uh, and um, it's um, <coughs> very, very excellent. Um, but um, it withered under. Phil Goff, and it's being trashed by um, Wayne Brown. Um, and that to me is a, a real crime because um, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there um, that take just transitions very seriously um, around the city. And lots more should have been happening, should be happening on that, if only that program, uh, that very elaborate program, was properly. Uh, resourced and staffed, which is not mm. an increasingly lesser. Mm. I mean, I, I just think about if you put a tax on a, a vehicle, we're going to be fine because we can all afford, afford to buy an electric car or work our way towards it. But people who can't afford to do that are the ones who are going to be taxed. And that doesn't seem yeah. just or fair at all. Yeah. And I. <laughs> But be careful how I say this it might sound as I believe in the trickle down theory, which I don't, um, of economics. Um, I felt very, rather guilty in 2004 uh, when I finally managed to buy a second hand Prius and I was trying to sell my V6 Camry. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so I put it. 
you know, online. And um, a family, sorry, I have to use the details, sorry, it sounds awful, uh, particular, uh, who were from a westerly direction, uh, <laughs> turned up in an even older Holden V8. <laughs> and so for them, it was a step up yes. from a, an elderly V8 Holden to a, a somewhat less old V6 Camry. They were going to save on fuel. And they would seem to be quite happy to give up a couple of cylinders. And so, um, so that's progress. It like, is. It is. But it's, it's, suddenly it's, introduced taxes on it. So yeah, yeah. Kick that, that was a simple mm. consumer choice mm. market mechanism there. Yeah. Well, because the it's really interesting because I I wanted to have a deep discussion with them about. <laughs> yeah, giving up the Holden identity. <laughs> How's this Camry going to go down in the neighbourhood? But I felt I just, I don't know these people. <laughs> they were very happy, so it was all right. It is about education, Rod, isn't it? And, and I, th I think we forget the good stuff that's being done in schools. And yeah. the groups of children oh, who yes. are going out doing part of with their teachers and their parents. Yeah. And I've seen it happen. Yeah. And I think that they're a good beginning. Yeah. Um, there must be people in the room who have um, children who, some years ago, um, were at school, uh, or grandchildren now who um, are in Varus, in, in Varus schools, schools doing yes. the in Varus schools program. Mm -hmm. uh, does any, has anybody run across it? It's just such a fabulous program that's been running now for. I know, 20 yeah, years or so. Yeah. But three cheers for teachers, I said. Oh, yeah, 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 no, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because it does entirely uh, rely on an awful lot of volunteer. There's very few schools that actually um, resource teachers <coughs> to run the Enviro Schools program. Yeah. It's very much a commitment teachers make um, to add that mm. responsibility to their tasks. So Meadow, Meadow Bank and um, Churchill Park School are the, are the big Enviro schools around here. Ah, good. Mm. And good it's very, know. very well run and the teachers are fantastic. And it's, I, I forget, it's a long time since I've been in the Enviro School, but I've got vivid memories of um, visiting some Enviro Schools a few years back and um, the kids were just so into it all. Just absolutely adored it. I mean, they were adored it. Yeah, that's <laughs> okay.